Okay, now for chapter 2. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, neighboring Colossae. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, many of the commentators believe that Paul is alluding to having never been to these regions. I do not believe that whatsoever. I'm, firm, I'm firmly in the camp that believes that Paul established these churches. At the very least, Colossae. But this is probably after he departed from that area. And all of these people had heard about Paul came in, these new converts. And so that's probably who he's speaking of right there. Verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Basically, Paul is concerned that these areas, this Laodicean and Colossi church would not be led astray by false doctrines or Judaizers. And I would say that that was a constant fear of Paul's, how once that he left, others would come in and sow discord and spread false doctrine. But Paul makes a specific mention that he desires for these churches to know the mystery of Christ. So Paul, one of his main missions was that of revealing, not just spreading the gospel, but revealing these secrets under the churches, these hidden treasures, as he alludes to in verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, speaking of Christ. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Charles Zellicott noted how Christ is the mystery of God. In essence, according to the scriptural meaning of the word mystery, he in whom the inscrutable nature of God, rich in the hidden treasure of wisdom and knowledge, is revealed to us. The name again leads up to the doctrine of the word of God, which we went over in the previous study. To us now, it's part of normal teachings, normal doctrine to hear that God himself has walked in human flesh through Jesus Christ on the earth among us. That's normal to us now within the church, that is. But back then, you know, especially to the Jews, they probably could not have ever comprehended that God would become a man. And even to this day, Ben Shapiro he even says this. He's an Orthodox Jew. I love Ben to death. But even he has said that they do not believe the Messiah to be God in the flesh. They believe him to be a Davidic type king. Someone in whom will lead them in order to rule over the whole world. Verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, and ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now just a quick note, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, that means confirmed, confirmed in the faith. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, which is above the world. And notice, he likens this rudiments of the world, even the law itself, the law of Moses, he likens unto just that of worldly things. For the law was given because of transgressions. It was to keep people in line until the time of Christ. But uh, once that Christ came, now we know the spiritual things, which is above and the spirit unseen, not of this world. Jesus even said that to uh, Pontius Pilate, how his kingdom is not of this world. Verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What an enormous verse that that truly is. And once again, as we went over in the previous study about this fullness of the Godhead, Christ being alone that because he is both God and man he's the only mediator between God and man there are no angels that be God and man there are no fallen angels no spirits no seraphim cherubim no nothing 
no, nothing. Not Elijah, Paul, Moses, Simon Peter, none of these could ever be Christ. Christ alone is that bridge between the fallen world and whom the Father cannot have anything to do with because he is pure and holy and transcendent and in heaven. But through his word, the Son, the great messenger, through him is there a bridge. And suddenly the fullness of the Godhead becomes known because he can both be in heaven and then descend to the earth as he did many times in the Old Testament. But anyway, verse 10, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, spiritually. And uh, you have a new heart, you are a new creature, a new creation, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. If you'll notice how in the Old Testament, just as Charles Ellicott noted, how the bodily circumcision was but of one member. In mere symbolism of one form of purity. So the Old Testament circumcision was just a shadow of the greater thing in which now we know is spiritual. Putting away the flesh totally. Cutting it all off and casting it away and walking in the spirit. Now pay close attention to verse 12 where he states buried with him in baptism are we. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Notice how Paul, he's using stronger language than one may expect, because he says that we are buried with him, not just dead. Burial being greater than death puts away sin forever. Once something is buried, it is done. Burial being greater than death puts away sin forever, upon which being brought back a new creature through faith in God, you are without sin. Many people speculate on what our glorified bodies are going to be. Are they going to be these old bodies just patched up? Or are they going to be totally new bodies and these just part of the earth? glorified means it is completely made new just as all things are made new after all of this is summed up verse 13 and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses blotting out the handwriting of ordinances by which he's talking about the law even the law of Moses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Because remember, my friends, everyone living under the law is cursed. But Christ being nailed to a tree, not stoned in the traditional fashions of the Jews, but by the Gentiles, nailed to the tree, which every man nailed to a tree, is cursed, what the Old Testament declares. So Christ became a curse for us. And the law stops at the cross. Now we walk in newness of spirit. Verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, what is being said right here? Something quite astounding, actually. Barnes commented, Satan and his legions had invaded the earth and drawn its inhabitants into captivity and subjected them to their evil reign. Christ, by his death, subdues the invaders and recaptures those whom they had subdued. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And I really like the uh, imagery that Paul is using right here. All of these, you know, you'll meet everyone. There's always one or two in every church. They're trying to keep the Sabbath. They're um, not eating pork or whatever. And to which, if, if, if they wish to do that, that's fine. So long as they don't hang their salvation on that, 
then um, it, it's fine. It's it's not hurting anything. Many people don't celebrate Christmas because they say, well, it's a pagan holiday. If they, if they choose not to, then so be it. You know, they, they don't have to. But no argument should be made about it. These are trivial things to argue about. Very petty, in my opinion. But uh, Paul says... All of these things, like the Sabbath and um, the Passover, all of these things were shadows of things to come. Like a shadow that your body cast. But Christ is the body. Christ is the actual thing that those things represented. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So Paul is telling them, don't start worshiping angels, don't start worshiping creation. And this immediately brings to mind the Catholic Church to me. Now, I'm not saying that all Catholics aren't Christians or anything, but I do believe that they are heavily misled. Matthew Henry noted, those who worship angels disclaim Christ who is the only mediator between God and man. It is an insult to Christ, who is the head of the church, to use any intercessors but him, including Mary. Here's an actual headline from Catholic News Agency. Five angelic prayers everyone should know. And though many Catholics will deny that Catholics pray to their guardian angel, this is an actual thing. Just look it up. Here's from PillarCatholic.com. Guardian angels, one of the first prayers many cradle Catholics are taught is directed to their guardian angels. In essence, a certain prayer goes as this, Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light, to guard, to rule, to guide, amen. Do not pray to angels. And my friends, all it takes is a quick Google search. Catholic prayer to angels, Catholic prayer to Mary, Catholic prayer to saints, and they pray to so many. And uh, a few of them do pray to God, though. Verse 19, and not holding the head, which is Christ in the highest of exaltations, from which all the body, meaning the church, by joints and bands, having nourishment and ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Paul is, of course, working through the imagery of the human body. And he says how the head, it, it supplies everything needed. It's the reason why I'm moving my hands right now is because of my head, my brain, my soul, and so forth. So um, without the head, what we have nothing. And what's being signified by this increaseth with the increase of God, he's likening the growth of the human body to the growth of the spiritual aspect of the church that is spiritual perfection wherefore if ye be dead with christ from the rudiments of the world if you be dead with christ from the rudiments of the world why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances why fall back on such earthly things touch not taste not handle not which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will, worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. In essence, what he's saying is that these things have not any value against the indulgence of the flesh. 